Welcome to these Travel Times talks here at the Adventure Overland Show 2017. Uh, these are brought to you in partnership with Rimmer Brothers, who have a vast array of aftermarket OEM and genuine parts for all Land Rover vehicles at competitive prices. More importantly to you guys, they will deliver them all around the world fast. So if you have any problems, these are the places to come to. There's now a brand new accessories catalogue out with a comprehensive range of Land Rover vehicles from Range Rover Classics up to, well, vehicles of today. There's also the popular parts catalogue and this is a great accessory to put in your glove box. For more details, do visit the website at rimmerbrothers.co.uk. Enjoy the talk. Well, thank, thank, you, thank you for coming. Um, I don't know, it's difficult to, if those of you who were here for the last um, a session, I can't quite follow that. Fantastic and so well rehearsed, you just knew it. I have actually got notes because I will forget. It's a lot to do with my age. Uh, I'm Linda, Ian, and really we've only come to say what we did. And, and why, and, and why, why we kind of why. talked about it. Um, and just to share what, you know, we know many of you will have done so much more than we've ever done. And and some of you may not yet have sort of got gone and ventured beyond um, our own little island. But why we did it, what we did, how much we enjoyed it, and why we want to do a bit more, really. Okay, so I will try and, I will have to keep putting my glasses on. You really are. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, it started when Ian went travelling four men on four bikes in 2010 and Ian went on a trip to Morocco had such an amazing time it looks like the writing isn't going to work to apologise, it looks like the, the did work slightly different but there because we go. it's on the apple and um, they had an amazing time Ian and I got together and he wanted to share that experience and he said right, don't want you to do any reading we're going to go on a trip and I've been saving five pound notes so you don't have to pay anything but do not read, you will not want to come with me the, the, the general idea of that is nearly everything you read on the internet, reviews or whatever else, there'll be more negatives than positives. Now, and I would have read the negatives. She would have read the negatives yeah. and, and taken them all in. Now, at the time, what she didn't know, and this is probably the first time it's, she'll really know, is it was only probably about 18 months prior to this trip that Marrakesh had been bombed by a terrorist attack. So that was why she wasn't allowed to read anything about going to Morocco. There we go. Okay. Well, we took we took the T5, and just to have a little bit more comfort. I don't ride a bike. I didn't fancy being pillion, and you know I just wanted a little bit more comfort. We literally put an IKEA bed from um, eBay in the back, a futon it was, and Ian put a cupboard with a bit of MDF, in and we went. We didn't have toilets or anything. We did have wet wipes. Fantastic. <laughs> we could wash, and we then we did actually have an amazing. Two and a half weeks, it was just during the Easter holidays, I was still working, couldn't get much time away. We spent two and a half weeks, most of it in Morocco. We were fortunate enough to get really cheap tickets to um, Santander. Someone couldn't go and they gave us some half price, which was wonderful. So it wasn't quite so much driving. Um, just wonderful adventures, really. Uh, and different. I, I'm known for falling asleep. I'm, I was, I'm, I'm not so now because I'm not working, but I used to fall asleep just like that. If I was in a car, I'm like a baby, I'm asleep. I didn't sleep in the vehicle for two and a half weeks because I couldn't bear to miss a thing. Every time I closed my eyes, it would be snow, it would be desert, it would be rock, it would be something else. And it was just amazing. I didn't even know these places almost existed. I hadn't been off our island very often. Um, and we just had. Fabulous, fabulous time for two and a half weeks. And at one stage, we'd, we'd done about 12 days, and she said, can we just stop? My head is about to explode. And it wasn't because me being me or whatever else, it was just trying to absorb everything yeah. in a short period of time. Well, these ones we just put on because you just don't get noticed. You don't get any signs saying the road's going to stop. And not just going to stop, you're gonna to have to find yourself a way round because right. actually, and this might have happened months before, I don't know, and you just had to go through and we had so many adventures and the pictures we've got even in front of the truck are such a minute part of the fun we had and the adventure we had. I put that in because this actually came up on Google Earth just after we got home and Ian's saying, oh look, this is where we went, this is where we went, because I kind of wasn't sure where we'd gone. I kind of let him do the driving and I don't know if anyone got any ideas what that is. It isn't a crop circle. That's sort of the kind of guy Ian is. He'd done a, he did a donut in the T5, T5. because he could, and no he one could. was there, and he said, I can get a perfect circle. And it was for a while, I don't think it's there now. It was on Google yeah. Map, Google Earth. 
And if that's my donut, look, it's my donut. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, lots of people on the way. We, and again, it's breakdowns. You have to break down. It is going something that will break down. Because yeah. if you're going to meet people, that's the way you're going to meet them. And these are people we met because they'd broken down. And I think you've got some eBay purchase you were trying to fix yeah, their two, puncture two, with. Two Spaniards, and we're out on the outskirts of Zagora. And they were going to do the peace run towards Zagora, up towards Mazuga. And they'd blown the back tyre on the one KTM. And they'd been there for a while, and they were trying to pump it with a hand pump or whatever, and it wasn't working. And I had an eBay 12 volt compressor, which had destroyed just for the pump, because I used to carry it on the bike. The trouble is, it was so hot, the pump wouldn't do anything, it was burning itself out and, and lacquering the valve, the, the, the piston on the barrel. So the guy eventually he used his last CO2 canister, shoved it on the tube, blew the tire up, and just rode off across the desert. That's all it needed. But he spent an hour and a half thinking about it when actually he just fired it up and gone. Um, and these photos really just. Uh um, to show another couple we met, we'd gone over to near Tamtatouche, was it? Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. A, little, a little auberge in the mountains, and we'd watched these guys going past on their KTM, because KTMs. And Ian was sort of like a bit jealous because he hadn't bought his KTM. We'd only got the van, so he was like, "Oh, look at these! Oh, that that girl looks nervous, doesn't she?" And we went Typically, off. Typically, it must have been the girl looking nervous. It wouldn't have been the bloke, obviously. We, we went off to go and see a salt mine with a guy from the auberge that we'd met. Ian had met previously. And we got a phone, he got a phone call to say, the girl's come back on her bike with her husband on the back of his, on her bike. He'd actually somersaulted into a dry riverbed. And his leg was, at the, at the point when we got to the hospital, they said it wasn't smashed, it was a fracture. It was smashed to smashed bits. Piece, and he, he very nearly lost his leg. Now, the, not the funny side of the story, really, because it was a very painful time for him. We, we got back there, because there they didn't have, they had a donkey? Yeah. No, they had a, they had a, oh, motor, they had a moped. moped. They had no way of getting this guy to hospital. So we took the van back, and they wrote ambulance in Burbet. Burbet on the back. And um, I drove Hans, the, the German guy. We thought we were going to be to Tinuia, but it ended up being to, what was that? 180 <laughs> kilometres away from where we were. I had no idea. I had never driven the van. We'd only got it at Christmas. I've never driven left-hand side of the road, right-hand side, right-hand right -hand side. side. Yeah. And he, he said, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. I'm, I'm going to go and get his bike. You'll have to go and take this guy to hospital. So the guy from the uh, auberge was there spending the whole time trying to make sure I was covered up because I'd got a dress on that had my bit of shoulder showing and he was very worried that I was going to go into the town with shoulders, sh shoulders bare. And we ended up getting there. We'd never have seen inside of two hospitals. It was fascinating to see Moroccan hospitals. So yeah. there, there, there's a slight issue there because the, the German chap he binned the bike into the riverbed, and I said, "It's all well and good. I'll go and collect your bike, get a lift up there, and it was about 10k up into the mountains. That's fine." I said, "The trouble is, I don't have a helmet, don't have leathers or anything. I need to borrow yours." So he lent me his helmet, put the helmet on, lent me his coat, put, put the coat on, and he gave me one of his gloves. Well, gave me a glove. Right, right, one glove. I said, I need two, and he gave me the other glove, but when he was 14, he'd blown the top of his hand off. So his second glove, had a it finger. was sewn up at the knuckle, so I couldn't get my hand into the second he glove. had one finger. So I was dressed in just a pair of linen trousers and a pair of silly boots, expecting to have only travelled probably about 30k to the first hospital. We got there, and I've got 20 dirham, which is about two pounds a, on a good day. So I had no money, no passport, no paperwork for this bike that I'm riding, which I shouldn't be riding, I've got no insurance anyway. The first time, no, sorry, they're not here, we don't have an x-ray machine. It's 130 kilometers to the next city, which was, was as that, carry on, and that's where they've gone. I think, well, I can't even afford a bottle of water. Anyway, all said and done, the, the German girl who was on the bike with me following, she filled the bike up, she bought me a bottle of water, because that's all I needed, and off we went. 130 kilometers through the, the, the desert and whatever else. On, the, on tarmac, so it wasn't too bad. Got to the hospital, got off the bike, just took all the, the bike gear off, walked into the hospital, and all the nurses are looking at me and think, oh, it must be a Western man just walked in, you know. <laughs> uh, what I didn't realise, I was burnt to hell on the face, because it was only like an open face helmet. My one hand was red across there, but a, a, a tan line across there. I looked an absolute pillow. It wasn't the fact that it was a Western man in the thing, I looked a pillow. But as Linda said, the best way to look inside a hospital to realise actually I never want to be in a hospital on the wrong side of the doctor because it's grim and we're only talking two and a half years ago the doctor's walking around in a tracksuit they lifted the little girl uh, like a bag of potatoes this is like a bag of potatoes bonk dropped her on the stretcher and she was howling 
and off they go. Things crawling everywhere on the windowsills. Yeah. So what, what one thing is, don't end up in hospital. Okay. Um, some of the things we saw, I don't know, some of you may have been and seen, it's, um, what's, it, what's his name now? Hans-Jörg. Hans-Jörg Boff, a German artist who created, they're almost like follies because he could, he designed them. This one's, it was based on Orion, the star constellation of Orion, and their towers in the middle of the desert. You know, and Ian had been to see them on his bike and he said, oh, we can get across, you've got to cross a river to get there. It's a dry riverbed, it's a lot of fesh fesh, it's a little bit tricky, we, we did manage it. When we went just two years ago, you can see the cars are parked right by Ar uh, the Orion, uh, city of Orion. You could go up in the towers and you, we actually had the guardian make us a cup of tea and chat to us and tell us all about how a camel had fallen in the bottom picture. It's like um, Fibonacci spiral of a, a snail and you can go down, you could have gone down. We didn't get an opportunity to go down because the guardian wasn't in that, that one and they're, they're quite a distance apart. A camel had fallen and they actually took it out skinned it and ate it and there's photos in this book he was giving us the gory details and I turned the photo page and it was like oh I didn't need the pictures so it was just that was just fascinating itself the fact we could get so close and this is the, the sky stairway and we actually parked outside we had our um, I think we, pot we, noodle and prosecco on the steps and yeah, we camped there for the night right at the foot of this stairway I'd, I'd gone there um, five years previously on the bike on the KTM there were four lads on the bike and you can go pretty much anywhere on the bike now, fesh fesh, for anyone that doesn't know, is a very white powdery sand. It's like trying to ride through talcum powder. And it's, it's very difficult to drive through it with a fairly reasonable vehicle. You've got to lower the tyre pressure and do all this, that and the other to you know, hammer it through. So before I went, I said to the, one of the lads that I'd gone with on the bike, I said, I'm going to get my T5 to the bottom of that uh, staircase. He said, impossible, it's never going to happen. And I said, but bearing in mind though, you know me, I'll get there. So I purposely packed a pot noodle each and a bottle of Prosecco. So we got uh, through the riverbed, through the, uh, as you we went along, it was about 10K through the riverbeds and whatever else, got to this staircase, sat there, took a picture of pot noodle Prosecco, WhatsApped it to him, and he's, he, he's never forgotten, basically. Can I ask a question? Yes. yes. It is, four motion, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was just basically saying, we, when some of the sunsets and sunrises um, in different places, we were absolutely hooked. Yeah. And part of the reason that in the end we decided, you know, we have to do more of this, just travelling through, and it was, I think it was um, somewhere like Casablanca, a city, and there were Maserati garages on the left, and on the other side there were like shanty buildings, and I, there was a, a guy there, big smile, smiling at us, in a, you know, as we were going past, sweeping with a bit of a palm leaf. And I thought, which side of the road do I want? They look stressed out trying to get the next biggest car, the next thing, all these people. And this guy had everything, much more than they. He had time. Yeah. He was smiling, his family were around him. He didn't seem to appear to have much. And I thought, I know which side of the street I want. I want to sit on, the, I want on that side of the street. I want some time. I thought, I went home and I said, we have a lovely three bedroom detached house. We work six days a week to live in that. We're never going to own it before we die. Mm. And we spend the seventh day cleaning it, cutting the garden back so you can sit in it, shopping, and then getting ready for the, on that wheel. And I said, I'm done. I'm done. Don't want this. We, we sell. Yeah. The, so. the, these, the, the pictures that are on here, the, the, the picture on the right hand side you can see is the sunrise at Erg Chevy in Mazuga. And literally five o'clock in the morning, you go up there, you could sit there for the whole period, nothing, no one, anything at all, and just take it all in. The, the last three, we'd come up past Rabat, and we'd been driving for a few hours, I thought, we're just gonna stop for a couple of hours before we leave Morocco, because that's pretty much on the way out. And all the way down the Atlantic coast in Morocco, there were military outposts. It's about every kilometer, there's a military guard on there. And it's just, they're protecting their sovereignty, basically. And we sat, where, where the, the, the sand dunes are, not a soul, anywhere. And about half an hour later, two blokes come up, one's with walkie talkie and he's got a pistol on his side there, and they were the military police coming to see what we were up to. And as soon as we said, look, we're just here, gonna watch the sunset and we're off anyway, not a problem, he said, as long as you clear it today, yeah, as long as you're gone, not a problem at all. And they literally walked off, and it is like one of these films, you turn around, you turn back. And they've gone in there. different directions they went as well. Yeah. So that was it, we decided a change of life. The house went on the market. By, that was in the April, by November we'd gone to Germany. We bought the truck in Germany, ex-military uh, Iveco. We got the box from Hull, and then it was a matter of quite a fun time putting the two together with Manitou's and various things and asking lots of yes, favours. We realised we couldn't have it in front of the house after we'd parked it for, what, 24 hours and the waterboard came to fix pipes. 
Uh, what, I think what we might have happened, like lent too we, much weight on it. We parked it, it on a, a, a grass in a grassed area in front of the house, and we were uh, in a row of probably ten houses. We parked it on the grass. Then, literally, the next night, so twenty-four hours later, all of a sudden, power cut. Whatever. Looked out the window. Everybody's gone off. Must be the you know, MEB or whatever's gone. And about an hour later, all these orange flashing lights are coming outside. Mm -hmm. Something's happened. It had turned out that the cable at the front of the neighbor's drive had split and shorted and blown the whole substation in our area. 24 hours after we'd parked our truck outside the house. On some very wet ground. <laughs> we think maybe sure, we but, might have just know. stretched the cable. We don't know. We moved, we were moving anyway. It, it we'd sold the house. <laughs> we never said anything no. and no one kind of rem remembered. Um, Okay, and the reason we chose on, we, you know, there's lots of reasons, and I know we've talked to guys going in their cars or um, backpacking. We wanted to have, I wanted a bit of comfort, mm. and the one thing I really missed, because in the middle of the desert, you think you're on your own, you just go, and there's a 10 year old sort of looking at you, and you think, oh, I didn't think anyone was here. And I just, I, you know, I, want to, I need to have a toilet. If I'm going to go <laughs> traveling, I, 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 maybe it's really firstly, I just would like a toilet. Yeah. So I said, a little bit more comfort again, you know, just. You know, this is this could end up being our home for good, mm -hmm. so we'll have a bit more comfort. Ian, luckily, and he said to me, you know, I'll, I'll get it because I can because I've got my license anyway. I actually went and did took my license to drive up to 18 tons yeah. because I wanted insurance. As in, if Ian fell off the ladder or did something stupid on his bike, I could drive home. Mm -hmm. or, She'd probably either leave me there wherever I was yeah, going. Yeah, or if I just needed to drive home. So we got the truck. Um, there was a little bit of. Uh, cutting the, the truck was longer than the box we bought so Ian cut a bit off we were thinking maybe a balcony Ian was thinking more of a pulley to put his bike on the back so the truck was chopped chopped up glued and welded and bolted and various things by then we'd moved to a very damp very old but very cheap farmhouse mm. on a farm with about 800 acres brilliant for test driving we can go anywhere you like. There was actually a, a, a motocross track there, which we did have a little bit of a play on. Yeah. And we thought, well, if it stays on here, I don't think we're going to do much more extreme than this. So we, we were really able to test that glue and various things that Ian had put on there to keep the two bits together. So fantastic. This was a little bit of um, planning. It actually isn't the layout that we did. That was quite, you know, the bit of computer work we did. We were impressed yeah. there. We actually did some pictures. It's not. We did most of the planning on the journey back from Germany with bits of paper that were on a table in the truck stop because we had a nice truck stop mm. dinner because we had a lorry so we were allowed to go in the truck, truck cafe and we folded bits of paper and I said, oh the shower's not going to work there, we're going to end up with a corridor, we try this and we, we literally planned it on the way home from Germany. Yeah. And then Ian just sketched things on the wall of the truck, saying, oh, I'll need to cut this and I'll need to cut that. And I will just add, there may be spelling mistakes on it, if you can see any of the writing. The spelling mistakes were on purpose, because Lynn is an ex-head teacher. An apostrophe out of place, a spelling mistake, anything like that does a head in. So I have to do it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there were some very unusual spellings <laughs> in the truck. And they're still there behind the board. Yeah. So, you know, a little bit of planning, so Ian was ready to go. And I have to say, I haven't done anything. I did a T5, I, bit of woodwork I, and a T5 once. By trade, <coughs> repair washing machines. So it, th this sort of talk is as much as say you don't have to be an engineer, a carpenter, a, a, a space scientist or whatever else. I just repaired washing machines for a living, but I decided I was going to build a truck. Okay. We had the problem that the truck, the box, would still had all these lovely metal units in. And they were really lovely, like mm. snap-on, tool quality. Ian had started throwing them out and someone said, hey, you could probably get many. We paid £750 for the box on the back. We sold those for £550. So, you know, bargain. We were about to just phone the scrap guy and say, yeah. can you come and collect a load of rubbish? And someone said, why don't you just have a go? You might get them sold. So we were really pleased. We sold. Someone had a really, has a really nice garage workshop now. So out with the old. Um, this was the first sort of fittings. We wanted to get the truck registered as a camper. So we ha you have a list, I think almost like 10 things you've got to have in there. So we literally put the things in. It didn't matter that it and, wasn't and in any way finished. This, this, this finish, these are the only pictures the DVLA had of me converting the truck to a camper. So yeah. if anybody's thinking, oh, I've got to get it all tidy, I've got to do this, that and the other. If you look at where it says table and seat, yeah. in, there's a, a cup sat on the table. Uh, sorry, a mug sat on the table. The mug sat on the table on purpose because the tube that's holding the table up is off a vacuum cleaner. 
So to balance the table, I had to put the cup in the middle <laughs> and get the photo quick. over and get the picture quick before all. We have over. a table because we had to have a table. Yeah, you have random. to have a table to be ready. And there were a few the other table. things, but we you just yeah. we just did the bare the bare minimum just to get it um, get it started. So that was on that was going on inside. Meanwhile, outside, Max, my friend Max, is here today. Uh, I, I'd got an idea I wanted four seasons, four different seasons with trees, and I said, well, I can't paint Max. You know, you can paint, can't you, Max? So we, we, we got some scaffolding for her, we got a step ladder, and we got and her up there really unbalanced, you know. And uh, yeah, outside and four seasons was, uh, became. And I have to say, as much as and it's not everybody's cup of tea, and it wasn't Ian's cup of tea, but I was going to go on a trip, as, you know, so I thought, I've got to have a little bit of a say. You're going to probably take toys are going to play with so I'm going to have a say so I said can I choose what colour way we paint it and he was oh, okay okay it actually was really good because we got photographed so much mm. it was very unlikely to be robbed yeah. because there was always someone there going yeah. taking a photo thinking yeah. what have they done what's what is this so I think I think it paid off it was good insurance um, and this was they say September last year we were hoping to be going from the show Ian didn't give up work till October. He was still doing this while working six days a week. He then started having, he started having Thursday off, yeah. continued to work Saturday. So he had two days a week. And I was chomping because I'd finished in July, I'd given up teaching and I was like, come on, we've got to go, we've got to get ready, we've got to get ready. And it was like, just do this. I said, it doesn't matter if it's not ready. Mm. And um, he got the inside pretty much. We've still got things we'd like to do, a cupboard in the bathroom and little bits, but it was pretty much, I said, this, this is fine. This is, you know, don't wait to be ready. It's that, you know, you can, I'll invite you for supper when I've decorated the dining room or when the house is finished. And you never invite your friends around because you never finish. So I said, I'm not having that, we're going. He had 24 hours almost. I said, if you want to take that KTM, we're going. I, honestly, I'm, I'm not waiting. It's, it was the 22nd of November when we finally left. And I said, if you want to take it, you can sort something out quick. So he had to just think, he sat on the deck chair looking at it. Oh, God, what, metal, what metals have I got? What can I do? What can what? weld? Guess what? The KTM the went day, with us. The KTM went with us. It wasn't the I best. Wasn't going without it. <laughs> it wasn't the best. Um, um, it's not the best. You see, there'd be, be a lot of diehards out there saying, oh, you can't do that because you've got no exit angles and this and that and other, or all the other bits and pieces. It doesn't matter because, again, I could have spent another six months making a frame that would have worked or whatever. What most people don't realise is the frame actually is cantilever. I can take the bike off and roll it all the way up out of the way and go where I want anyway. But the diehards are looking at it and say, you can't do that. Well, you can. We did. Yeah. And, you know, it's as simple and, as that. And so we ended up leaving on the 22nd. Did you have to take it off the back? Yeah, yeah. rode it everywhere. Yeah, but did you take it off the back because of the departure angle? No, 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 no. We just we only avoided one one case where it would have decked out properly, but we went round the obstacle. So, and we did go through some. Um, I think this was just after. I don't know if it's going to play. No, it's a different. Thing. Oh, that means the videos. Aren't. No. Videos. Sorry, there were play. a couple of little videos. Oh, yes, there is. We, we, we left in November, we travelled down to France, to Spain, quick stop in Portugal, parked it in Malaga and flew home to Christmas. When we went back, we picked the truck up, drove out to Morocco and that's when our real travel started as far as we were concerned. As you can see on the video clip, that was trying to get to a campsite. The campsite was at the top of the hill. We were coming back as a retreat because after going through this very narrow and it was horrible weather, got to the top, they had a, an arch and it was a really low arch. So we get <laughs> it wasn't for campsite, campers. Because we we're not that tall, really. A lot of campers are as tall or taller yeah. than us, but yeah. Okay. <coughs> That's okay. Um, this, was, this was right at the top of, is it the. Uh, Tis and Tess. Tis and Tess. Coming through the Atlas Mountains, and my daughter, we just dropped my daughter off at that point, and she was saying, "You, you don't keep taking my mum on these bad roads." You know, she was going to kill him, and we hadn't long, you know, dropped her off, and then every road from then on in got worse and worse and worse, and we got to the top of here. We actually arrived in the dark, unusual. We arrived in the dark in the morning. I think, oh god, it's really high up. We're really high up, and these roads are absolutely. Shit. And I am scared. Fortunately for me, it was really, the cloud was there, so I couldn't see, and I kept saying, it's just a field, it's a field, it's a road and it's a field. There isn't a drop and no one else is gonna come along. This is our road. I discovered what black and white roads mean on a Michelin map. 
on the Michelin map, on very few of the roads, certainly in Morocco, they've got a, a black and white line following the trail. And when you look at the legend, because possibly I didn't, impassable. I didn't tell Linda that there was a legend in the back of this map, and it says dangerous. And uh, so we, we we did some you know did some adventures. Now this this point at this point I would I don't yeah, want to try. And, oh, it doesn't matter. At this yeah, point, I will read my uh, video extract yeah. because a little bit later, I sort of a catastrophe. <laughs> Start. This is Ian, Ian always having to go that little bit. You know, there's an easy route, but why not do this one? Let's see how we can push it. So I'll just read what happened on that evening. So it's 10:30 on Friday, the 3rd of March. I'm sitting on the bed behind the driver's seat. Jack, which is my daughter's partner, has just told Jessica, my daughter, as a joke, Ian and I have split up, and we're in the middle of nowhere. Problem is, apart from the fact we haven't split up, I'm pretty pissed off because we are pretty much stuck in the middle of nowhere. We'd headed for Sidi Ifni toward our next stop, Plage Blanche. The first mistake is to ignore the things in the road that suggest the road is closed. Ian found a detour and ended up on a road, pretty much a new road to be fair. It wasn't a road that anyone should be travelling on. It wasn't even ready to be opened, but there was no one else apart from some locals on mopeds. The road went on for miles and miles along quite barren land. It got hilly, mountainy, still not sure when one becomes the other. Suddenly, as if it's in the case in Morocco, the lovely tarmac road ended. And yes, you guessed it, just where the road meets a river. But did that stop Ian? Oh no, not Ian. Some Germans managed to pass in a 4x4 to get across, but we were much too wide. So did that stop Ian? Oh no, not Ian. He just collected lots of rocks, took a detour through the riverbed and built up a ramp on the other side to the road on the other side. However, the road on the other side was not actually a road, but it was on Ian's sat-nav, not on our map. I got out at this point. I walked for a while because I refused to drive up such a dangerous, treacherous road. I did video him for a little while, but it got, just got worse and I couldn't look. I thought the Plage Blanche was just over the hill. But then we reached a fork in the road and the sign said 20 kilometres. Did that stop Ian? Oh no, not Ian. On and bleeding on, we travelled. The roads became less treacherous, at least no cliff falls, but we could have toppled over. Then it got dark, both tired, thrown about for hours on the rockiest, bumpiest roads ever. And did that stop Ian? Oh no, not Ian. Eventually they levelled out and we travelled along a road, you could barely make it out, of pebbles that was running parallel to the sea. After a few kilometres and still no sign of life, the tracks were impossible to follow and Ian drove about a bit looking for them but quickly realised we were close to sandy dunes which we did not want to travel on, particularly as we'd already nearly got stuck earlier that day before winding a way out. But did that stop Ian? Oh no, not Ian. We'd lost the road but it continued to be divided, uh, guided by the bloody sat-nav. And suddenly the road, the ground became quite wet with puddles all around. Ian had only said half an hour earlier that he avoids travelling. In fact, he said he doesn't drive through water because you can't tell how deep it is or what might or might not be underneath. So when the whole area was covered in water, did that stop Ian? Oh no, not Ian. He just went fast and said a few words of encouragement to the truck and ploughed right on in. Now, did that stop in? You bet your bloody life it did. And the truck, as we ended up at a 45 degree angle, passenger side into a bog of sorts. The driver's side wheels were not even on the ground. It definitely stopped Ian. We are now absolutely stuck in the middle of nowhere. Jack, you weren't wrong, really. Ian has been digging, thank heaven he bought his spade, for about an hour. He's managed to dig quite a trench under the scummy water and he's going to try the back wheel now. He's hoping to wedge it with bits of wood and things he's found under the wheels and he's hoping it will drive out. It is more than a little bit scary. It's late, it's dark and it's very close to the sea. A man came down at one point from somewhere up the hill. He had a torch but didn't speak English and as we don't speak Berber, the hill almost fell over on the slippery road which was only five bloody metres away. He disappeared again. I don't think anyone will be rescuing us anytime soon. And that was the next morning, after a night on the pist, <laughs> trying to get out of my side of the door. Uh, Ian did manage to get his bike off and went off to get help. I'm sat in the back of the truck thinking, how long are we going to be here? Thinking, oh, please, just someone come and rescue. There's nothing around, nothing around. And there's a very, very narrow road up a back uh, side of a hill. 
And I'm sat there, and the next thing, I can, I can just sort of think, can I hear something? And there was a white camper van, and it kind of just nosed its way around at the top of this hill, and I could just see it, and it was like, oh, piss off. And it went off like this, just as if it looked, no way am I going down, that's just too dangerous. I said, oh, please. And next thing, this red Mercedes came round. It's even rescue colours. I said, this is it. We are, we are saved. And they came round. He stopped. He got out. And he sort of looked at the road. Oh, we're not, he's, not going to, he's not going to risk coming down. He came down the road. He built up the road like Ian does. Built up the road. We knew they were going to be friends for a long time. Made the road a bit safer and drove his Mercedes down to us. Unfortunately, at seven and a half ton and we were ten ton, he didn't manage to get us out. Um, then they went off, left me again, went off to get more help. Next thing, JCB, they are definitely going to get us out. I said, JCB, I, I mean, absolutely going to get us out. I put a happy crew, because mm -hmm. the first thing this crew did, they came with a pickup as well, sat down with a bong, and they were <laughs> having a wild time. They, they were, were the bongs. happiest group of people we'd ever met. Now they he just watched them because he thought, I can't, I can't, because I can't really converse. I don't know what they're going to be doing. They then proceeded to dig the biggest trenches, like graves, both sides of the wheels that were up in the air. Great. It didn't just scoop a little bit, you know, let's scoop a bit. It might just, it was never going to do that, but we'll just scoop a bit. They just, like, Ksh! Ian later fell in one of the holes. That was quite funny. Yeah, I did video it. I don't know what they thought they were doing, but they, they, made, the they then made the road such up. a mess. They decided to build up the road where it was boggy. They thought, well, if we can get some dry road, we might get a bit of traction because they were spinning everywhere. They built up the road, so we ended up, the road was here, and we're now, not only are we stuck, we're actually lower than the road. And we're thinking, they're not going to get us out. They didn't get us out. They didn't. Bless them. They were lovely. And they were going to do it as well for 200, equivalent to 200, yeah. about 200 pounds, 2,000 dirham. Yeah. So we were like, oh, gosh, this will be no, if we get, get them out. So anyway, they said they would come back the next day with something else. Yeah. But part uh, after this, they disappeared. We stayed there. The German couple stayed and said, look, we'll, we'll share dinner. We'll have a bottle of wine or whatever else, and, and that's fine. About 10 o'clock at night, knock on the door. And you're in the middle of nowhere. Think, oh, all right. So we opened the door. There's a lad stood at, at, outside. And he said, oh, you, you, it's got to go. You must move it. Military say you must go this and it. He said, these guys are never coming back. We, I, I help you. All right, so a, a bit of language. And he said, I'll get two tractors. And I said, well, are they big tractors? Yes, they're 10 ton, duped, this, that, and the other, all single or dancing. Okay. And he wanted 500 euros. So I had to be quite stern and say, right, 500 euros, but my truck has to be parked there. No money until the truck's parked there. Two o'clock in the morning, two tractors turn up. Now, they probably use them for topping on a farm or just scurrying trees in a, in a whatever. They weighed about two ton each. They strap the two tractors on, and it's like the wacky racers. One, two, three, and bang, off they go. They're using rope, not chains, but rope. <laughs> Both of the ropes snap, they come flying back up the truck, all the rocks and shale and whatever, all up the windscreen, the front of the truck and whatever else. And I'm sat there thinking, this is gonna end bad. So they tied the ropes together again, by hand, yeah, no, nothing mechanical. One, two, three, wacky races, bang, off they go again, ropes snap, rocks all up the front and whatever else. And we're now about three o'clock in the morning, I just turned the ignition off, turned the lights off, got out and said, you've got to go, go, out. go home. It's, it's never gonna happen. But before, then, in the morning, the same guy arrived with another guy in a pickup who said he'd got all the equipment we could possibly need. He wanted two and a half thousand euros now. And we were thinking, you know, thinking, do you know what? I will dig into that myself. Yeah. There was another Moroccan, an older guy, a Moroccan guy came. He stripped down to his undergarments and said, five days. He was going to dig it I will have you out in five days. Well, he didn't actually say that. He said it in a little bit of French, and our yeah. German friends spoke French as well as German. Um, and th th he actually did start. He did start. He started digging. <laughs> he did start digging, with literally scooping mud with his hand and dragging bits of plastic and and bits of wood. But we just just leave him for, if he wants to get on. We no. don't. We didn't know what was going to be happening no. anytime soon. Luckily, a Leyland Daff turned up. Oh, you've got that one on there. And and it was a a, a tipper. What we did, he he had a long chain first. Didn't pull it. It, it didn't even move it. You can see it bouncing. Young lad, he had no worries at all in, in, in his life, basically. And he just reversed back up, half the chain, strapped it back on. There is no tow hook on the back of his truck either. He just clipped it to the chassis rail. You think, oh, fair enough. And he popped us out. And what he did, he lifted the, the back of the truck up, and you could see there was about 10 to 15 tonne of stone in there. So he weighed probably 25 tonne. And that's 
what got us up. But I missed the actual pulling out yeah. this of that video that you just on the bottom. But, but we were actually. I was so busy playing with there were some kittens and puppies on the beach, yeah, and I was I was we, busy we were chatting stuck to them. We were there for two and a half days. So. Was he double drive on the back? I, I don't know to be honest. He just pulled us and out. And he put the, he put it higher, didn't he, or something? Yeah. So it, it got us out. And he was um, from the JCB group, and all he wanted yeah. was two hundred. Two hundred. And 200 he was euros. more than happy. He wasn't trying to get anything more out of us. We we, we had a, that's when the the, the um, frame had to come off it and had to do a little bit of repair <coughs> to that. And then we realised there was a seal leak, and the guys in we we ended up in another town. And we were looking for a mechanic, and we just went past this this, this doorway, and there was someone meticulously putting um, hydraulic, pump. hydraulic pump together. And we thought, you know, he's looking like he knows what he's doing. He's he's, he's been just meticulous. I bet they can help us. They came out. They came into the camp. we have gone to a campsite so we could use their tools. And they said, yeah, we can do that. Come at nine o'clock in the morning. Park outside. First of all, they haven't got a 60 60 mil yeah. socket. Yeah. And we said, well, what's going to happen? And they invited him for a chicken to sheen deer dinner. Some a taxi arrives with a socket a few hours later and they get this off and then they look at the seal, they can't get the seal, the seal's up in Casablanca. And which is miles and miles away. And they said nine o'clock in the morning. They're gonna get a seal at nine o'clock in the morning, it's amazing. How much is this gonna cost? We haven't dared to ask, we just we just gotta get it fixed. And so we, we slept outside there on this road. It was amazing just watching the comings and goings, the videos we've got of different vehicles and uh, nine, just about 20 past nine 20 tap past tap nine. tap and they were there with the seal they fitted the seal a, a genuine seal had come from Casablanca they taxied it just keep swapping taxis all the way down until it got to them at about nine o'clock they they were then they were writing the the bill out and you could see them going and having a bit, bit of a discussion it, we'd already said if it costs about 300 euros to repair it all well and good it's got to be done or more and he gave us the bill and we went 110 euros for seven hours labor and a genuine seal in the diff. So it gave him a nice I wouldn't tip. go to Iveco in England and ask them to look at it. <laughs> yeah, expect to have a, a bill. Um, that then followed, and this is why breaking down is so much fun, because yeah. the German couple, uh, Gui, who was the driver of the German, uh, the Mercedes truck, and his wife Irma became quite good friends. They said, right, you know, you promised us a bike ride if we, if we helped you out. So Ian and Guru were able to get in their bikes and we both could drive the trucks. So we became their support crew and didn't they have fun? They, they've been traveling in Morocco for, oh, On and off for 20, 20 years. years. So they, they absolutely took us to places we would never have found in the middle of absolutely uh, nowhere. And this place is, there is a Tisgri, but there's two Tisgris. It's a bit like there's a Farnham and there's a Farnham, there's a village and there's a town. But this place is not signposted. It's, the only thing that says it's Tisgri is, is a painted stone that now the Tisgri has almost come off. And this, ag this Agadir in there was just, we had to walk quite some miles. We had to leave the trucks and we had to do quite a long bit of walking. But they, they said, we know it's here. We came 15 years ago, mm -hmm. but they'd been a few times at that point. And um, we managed to get the key to the door. I mean, it was quite, a, I mean, this Legitimate is, I, I'm sort of here. And it's quite a, we started up here and we had quite a walk to get up there. A little group of children in their flip-flops, with their feet hanging over the edge of their flip-flops because they didn't really fit, running like goats saying, come on, come on. And they're holding my hand and saying, come on, helping me down. And we managed to get right inside all of those vehicles. Go back. Uh, go into all those little rooms where they used to store all their, um, it's a fortified warehouse, isn't it, where they put all their, their sort of um, goods and we'd never found that amazing and this is just some of the we actually ended up helping them out we um, got them out of a bit of fresh fresh this is just some of the the roads we went on um, we realized we couldn't cross the river here just I don't know where well, we I, could, I could have crossed the river he said he could I, I, know I, could. I said you have I wasn't to, allowed no I, I watched what his wheel was doing because I was filming and I'd seen people all the bikes falling off so he actually did a, he did a five-point turn and uh, yeah okay Do you want me to do it? Okay, this is this was another place. This is like volcanic rock and we'd watched our friends get stuck and they got caught. We realised we could actually do a route round and he said, No, why why go round? I want to see if I can go through as well. So we had a bit of fun trying to get them through there. And I won't I won't put that one on. We we were um probably this is now in Zagora. 
and they said we'll go to the market in Zagora. So Lynn's driving the truck, all she's got to do is follow the people in front to get to the market. So if you follow the red truck on the video... Not the red truck, you've got to follow the people that I've got to watch, which is I've got a roller, I have got scooters, I've got pedestrians, I've got cars just pulling out in front of me, and I'm really, and I haven't really driven in town much, I've just driven in the desert. <laughs> this is probably my first time driving. And at this point you can see, I'm so busy watching all of what's going on, I've lost the Mercedes. And I'm heading completely in the wrong direction, because they've gone, they've actually turned off at this point. But I do, he does come to my rescue. But it was just to say, it, the traffic, they say put your lights on. Make mm -hmm. sure you've got your lights on. You think, what? Yeah, because you, you, there's not anything else that's going to scare yeah. you in, on that in, road. In Morocco and in most of Europe and in the Balkans, it is a legal requirement. You have wasn't to so much in Morocco, was it actually? By law. Wasn't in Morocco. Which is okay. fine. You put your lights on, but you'll have horse and cart. You'll have little wagons with um, circular saw blades on because they're going up into the hills to cut trees and everything else driving around you, but you must keep your lights on. Everything else will kill you, but you must keep your lights on. Yeah, and this was just some videos of um, you could. We, we what we were ended up doing is going from town to town in the truck, and Ian was able to, and Guru were able to play on their bikes. And I don't know if you actually see it; you might see it on those ones better. Ian gets bored, and it's just a. Sh I didn't know what he was going to be doing and I, I I've just had the camera on the dash we just keep a camera on the dash and I'm driving and the sound thank goodness is down because in in sort of you know oh, I'm just driving behind Gooey I might just overtake him but why just overtake him when I can actually jump on my seat and I can probably dance like a ballerina and fly past him so I'm, I'm sort of thinking okay idiot and I'm actually I must be concentrating because I'm not even saying swear words at this point and he um, gets on his seat then I realised he's actually going to overtake on the bumps and he's going to do it again and he's not going to get on his pedals. And I don't think you'll this, hear me, this, but I do say some words. Yeah, this is why Linda took a heavy goods licence before we went, as an insurance policy that if I was ever to do anything silly, she could always get the truck home. So, he did overtake. But I won't play them all because there's videos. The girls did have fun and there's some clips of us. We did have a lot of fun without the boys, so... Um, Oh, this was, this was, Ian had to think about wells. If we saw a well, he would have to go and look in the well. Only thing is he hadn't zipped his pocket up and his lovely new Windows phone landed in this well in the night before. And the German guys with us going home, we thought in the morning, we'll, we'll pretend he's, I've gone looking for it. So that's what they woke up to. And they said, we don't know anyone like you guys. Because those aren't, obviously I'm not down the well. I did stuff a pair of jeans and we set it all up so they'd get up in the morning thinking, oh my God. Uh, but yeah, any well, any well that he went to, but after that he was a bit more careful of his phone, I have to say. And just very quickly now, these are the same um, the, um, Hans George Swath's artwork. Just two years later, you cannot park near them. They put rocks round, a bit like Stonehenge. So you can't go and park up against it, you can't go and camp against it. You can't go inside now because it's got structurally not safe. Inside that staircase is the most amazing uh, metal wings. And there's photos of online of people standing in front of them, photos taken. And it's, it's just such a shame. And, then, and those are, I mean, if anyone wants the coordinates to go and find them on a trip, well worth it. We then, just some of the, some of the wonderful pictures. I found out I was a grandmother while I was up this mountain. And we had time with the nomad family because the guy from the auberge, I think, was dating one of the girls up in the, <laughs> in the mountain and said, come on, we'll take, I'll take you to visit. Just amazing experiences. I and back, back to the point that you had about it doesn't matter what vehicle you've got, that's what they have, a Renault 4, and they go everywhere in it, through yeah. the rivers, up the mountains, everywhere. It's 43 years old, and it'll probably go for another 40 years. Our truck sat next to it, it might last another four years, the way I use it, but that Renault 4 will still be going, so we totally get you don't need everything. And it's just a measure of which changing. When Ian went in 2010, he had a donkey. 2015, he had a moped. And he said, I'm going to get a car. And by 2017, he had a car. Now, just a uh, on those pictures, the top three, you've got the Renault 4 and then the, the Mule. The Mule actually cost as much as the Renault 4. <laughs> yes. They're about a thousand euros. Um, and then I'll just fly through these. This is just some of, um, this was a, um, was well, not just Roman ruins, there was a load of history behind this whole place in Volubilis on the way back up through Morocco. A pound go in, not even barely signposted. This was just to say, you can hide 
we are Clean hidden track. down there. You can you literally can park for free just about anywhere. You, they said do you know when you get to Croatia. If you look, I don't know whether you can see, but we're in the biggest, stupidest track wall painted, and I can probably see it better on the screen, but just there is the cab. So we've got it painted like anything you, that stands out, but you can hide anything without trying to hide it, just backed up by some trees. And the lovely view of Montserrat there is because we decided we'd try and do a bit of geocaching. And that's that lovely picture we got coming up there. And I'm going to fly through because yeah. of time. Just some of the views, Ian going off to play. And this one, Ian forcing me to jump out, take a picture, because we went to Monaco, and they were week for the Grand Prix. They closed all the sort of road, side roads off and, and set up the track, and that was the starting, I think it's starting grid. Position number four, that one. Yeah, and he said, get out, take a photo. I said, you can't stop, you can't stop, take a photo. So I am running in front of it to take the photo. And just some of the wonderful places. We dashed through. We did 20 countries, 20 countries in eight and a half months you could do it so you could do it a lot cheaper because we use a lot of fuel fuel mm. was the biggest cost and now i'm thinking i should have spent a month or two months in every country and i should still be there i will be so this is just croatia we we did do some wonderful um wild camping even in croatia i think you have to be kind of bold so i won't play any of those even in split we managed sometimes it's you can just you're lucky there was parking it was so much per hour and they said, you can do a 24 hour and we'll let you sleep in it. And it was the end of the train track. So it was cheap and we ended up going right in the center of Split, Montenegro. <coughs> and this, this was um, a campsite, 10 euros for the night. And they gave us beer when we arrived each. It was 10 for the, for the two of us, only 10. We had a beer each, we had coffee in the morning and we had free access to the pedal boat, the kayak, the, um, the canoes, their uh, cycles. Mm -hmm. And if you rode across, you could row across to Albania, but you would get caught by the um, border police. Yeah. Apparently, we didn't try. It was quite a long way over the uh, Lake Ochrid. And that's the, um, the communists, one of the communist buildings in, in um, Bulgaria that had actually been cemented over and you couldn't get in. We were lucky enough to find a hole. Ian and his friend went down a bit of a rope ladder. And we said, well, girls, we didn't want to go down. A different couple of friends. And just as we were leaving, after they'd played on it for a while, you're not getting in. Someone came with a ladder <coughs> and we said, oh, guys, can we, can we come down with you if you've got a ladder? So there's a different hole and it was, you know, literally 20, 20 foot down and quite a climb. And we managed to get down into it. I don't think you're supposed to, and there were cameras. I'm not sure they're working, but we ended up being right inside this amazing ex-communist building. It just, just so much sort of history, wonderful pictures and do it justice and again just people to stop we stopped in Austria people said don't go to Austria it will cost too much money uh, for the tolls and everything we got a go box thing at the border we put something like 90 odd euros on it we got back we used 11 euros we ended yeah. up with 80 something back because we didn't go on the motorways we went all through the Reed national parks and we we pulled up in this village um, Fleming, and uh, this guy in this Mercedes pulled up and said, Are you staying here? And we're like, oh, 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 he said, oh, because I've got a better place. Come and, come and park right by the river. It's mine. No one can turn you off. He went off to feed his bees, came back with three cold beers for us. Just lovely, lovely people. We have a place to stay now in Austria. <laughs> he has a place. And finally, do it. Just do it. Uh, sooner rather than later, things are changing fast. Things change every, you know, every time anyone goes. One border crossing, you get to the other and they say something different. Uh, don't believe everything you hear. And there are definitely far more good people in the world than bad. Ask for help if you have a problem. It's when you meet the best people. Because people like to help. It's the, it's the way we are. Border insurance was useful because it's in the country's language. So it makes it simpler when they get stopped. Wild camp with confidence, but discretion. But just sometimes we just, and that's one thing in the lorry, we could pull up at lorry parks or we could pull up and just look like a lorry if we turned it, just got the angle right. So people kind of thought, oh, it's just a lorry, just ignore them, they're not camping. Uh, you don't need a big truck. We enjoyed it. Um, but we, you don't. We, we're the first to stand here and say, you do not need a big truck. You can definitely do it in a car, you can do it on a motorbike. Mm. We only did the truck, one, it was because I already had a license and we didn't have to think too much about it. Our only real stipulation was to have a fixed bed. And I know you can do it in a Peugeot van, you can do it whatever you like in a Peugeot van, but I just like the idea of getting into the desert in Morocco and you can go wherever you like. You don't have to think, I'm going to bust something here, or I can't go on that road because there may be a couple of rocks or whatever else. 
a Land Rover, whatever. It's whatever takes your fancy, but don't put everything off because there's always the kids have got to go to university. You've got to wait for the kitchen to be refurb. You've got to wait for everything. We literally sold the house, moved to a cottage which you wouldn't want to live in. Oh, you would. It's lovely. <laughs> it's it's a bit we, damp. We, we moved to a cottage which I wouldn't want to live in. Um, but we did it because we know we've got grandkids, although I don't look that old, but we have got grandkids or whatever else. And the one big thing from it is that the older you get, the less time you have. Your grandkids, they'll see you go to, well they won't see you go to work, they'll just assume you're going to work every day, you come in, you might see them at the weekend and all this and the other. But our grandkids now will sit down and say, you were on holiday weren't you? You say yes. Yes, you got your you. truck stuck, didn't you, Grandad? Yes, I did. And you have stories and something to give them. The, the one thing Lynn was always worried about is that we travel somewhere, there'd be a problem at home. And I said, one of the first things was, it doesn't matter. Wherever you are, within reason, you're no more than probably six to eight hours away on a plane. It might cost you a thousand pounds to get on that plane. You might be lucky and find a cheap ticket for 40 quid, but you're only a few hours away. So if there's anything drastic at home, it doesn't okay. matter. You park, and as the guys before us said, there are so many people who will say, come to us, leave your truck, do this, do whatever else, and it works everywhere. So we've, we've done Morocco, down to Western Sahara, nothing but friendly people. We've done all the way through um, Europe, down to the Balkans, and whatever else, never ever had an issue with... Only, only twice Europe. were we asked to move. Once We'd already slept there the night anyway, so we said, oh no, we're going. <laughs> and it was only because there was a, um, a ghetto nearby and he was worried for our safety. And once in Morocco, because we possibly, there were landmines, and the police said, come and park by the station, or yeah. where they were, just out of kindness, never any other trouble. And one of the things, keep your plans flexible, almost, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter. And if your t-shirt says it, it didn't matter, because if we met someone, they said, you know, should we go on a tour? And the, the friends we met said, well, we're going there. We don't mind. We'll come along. We have no real plan other than I've got a wedding to go to in July, so I had to get back for that. But it's so nice just to be flexible. Not always think oh, I've got to meet somebody there, so it's going to be we're going to go to that point. So keep it flexible. So and uh, yeah, we avoided the motorways and we, we saw the countries. You could travel from Dover to Scotland on the motorway. You haven't seen England at all. You've seen a motorway. So and I just think just to, yeah, if you can't do it. And, um, you know, we had a house that we would probably still be, you know, be paying for until well, probably be dead. <laughs> we haven't got that now, not got quite the security, but you know what, we never know where we're going to live next. And I can remember having a house and someone saying to me, this is our last home, and I'm thinking, shit, I'm not ready. Have I got to decorate my own coffin and keep the garden nice? And I just thought, I'm not ready yet, I'm not, I'm not ready for this to be it. So, go out there, do it, and enjoy it. Okay. With, with the with the with the insurances, because I know there's a comment on our listing about border insurances and whatever else. With Morocco, you buy border insurance. You get off the boat, drive to the kiosk, you buy the insurance, and you're buying a third party policy only. You can get a green card in England, but that will still only cover you third party only. The same with Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro. You buy insurance at the border. With varying prices. Montenegro was 18 euros for about three weeks. Albania was 60 euros for two weeks. If you'd gone to Serbia, it would have been 120 euros for a week. We didn't go to Serbia because I think it's just whatever. But the point was that by buying border insurance at the country that you're entering, it's written in Arabic, Cyrillic, Austrian, whatever it's written in. If you have a problem or if the police just pull you over, you give them the insurance document, they can read it. There's no questioning whether it's valid or, or anything else whatsoever. We avoided the tolls only because, to start, we were thinking in a truck is going to cost a fortune. But actually what happened, it gave us so much of a trip because we ended up in the mountains, in the valleys, by the rivers, wherever you went. And Italy was probably the only one that we should have stayed on the tolls because it was such an awkward place to get around. But apart from that, it isn't that expensive. If you're in a, a sensible vehicle for fuel, you can do it on a very slim budget, as the previous guys have told you. We chose the truck, but that was because we chose the truck. The only expense we had over and above everything else, or everyone else, was the extra fuel. The living cost and everything else is exactly the same, no matter what you take. 
Well, thanks. Any questions? I know we really run out of time. If you've got any questions, we'll go outside actually on the garden. The garden. In the sunshine. In the sunshine. <laughs> but uh, that's, that was our story, and I hope you get to do yours at some point. We'll be back shortly at Adventure Overland 2017 with another Travel Times Talks. But for now, do check out any of our other videos. And of course, as always, a big thanks to Rimmer Brothers who have partnered with us to bring you these talks. Their new popular parts catalogue is available for all Land Rover vehicles and is a great addition to your glove box. For more information also, do check out www.rimmerbrothers.co.uk.